What's going on, everybody? Wednesday, back again. I'm still alive. <laughs> we're live. Uh, so today we're going to be doing some kind of bubble effects and stuff like that. Hanging with the homies. The Than, good to see you. Shades of Orange, Jeff, Jabraham. You made the uh, Brando, good to see you. you made the um, jump to Linux Mint, good to hear. It's pretty easy, right? It's like, it's almost easier than Windows these days. <laughs> Seems like at least. The, um, I know like the Houdini installer was the hardest part for me switching to um, to Linux because it's like all terminal based or whatever. So it took me a long time to, to figure that stuff out. But uh, it's, it's, it's all easier after that step, I would say. Let me, uh, let me see if I can find this. Yeah, Redshift as well, I think I remember running into some issues where like their their method for installing the um, licenses, it's a bit outdated. So like I needed to install some OpenGL libraries or something like that. We need to put in a um, a request with with Redshift so that they can update their the way that they compile that utility or whatever. It's better than Windows, right? This was what I was looking for. It's like uh, Windows was always like, regardless of how many different places you turn off their automatic restart, it will restart and your renders will halt and uh, simulations will be forked. Like it's that was always to me the one of the really frustrating things with Windows and it seems like it's only gotten worse. Um, in the more recent years and days and everything like that. So it give people a little bit more of a chance to, to come in before we really get started with stuff. But this breakdown I saw, it was just take a look at it while we're waiting or hanging out. I feel like this is, some of the stuff was pretty cool, but it was a lot of, um, Seemed like the, all the effects were were mainly comp. You saw the start; it was Scanline that produced the majority of these effects. Um, and I always kind of keep an eye on their work, just with water and oceans and fluids and stuff like that. They they do really cool stuff, and then destruction as well, like with Iron Man, um, when that whole mansion and hill was like landsliding into the water. They did that all that work, and they do a pretty good job. But maybe they didn't have a, a lot of time or resources for this project. So it seems like, I don't know, just a lot of this stuff to me. I guess it's, this looks like a render, but it, um, the lighting didn't seem that great or it seemed like it was a lot of just like two dimensional practical elements that they were layering on top or whatever. It's a lot of things going on. Like it's almost too much, too much stuff just like flying through the air and, and flying around and stuff like that. Like the, some of this, um, that water splash is just a bit, I don't know what it's meant to be. It's like a soda bottle or Coke or something like that. And then it turns, or I guess that's like the seltzer water next to it or something. But the, just the shape of that, uh, splash is a bit, I don't know. It's a bit muddy or it's a bit odd. Yeah, I don't know. It's a little messy, I would say. And then these chips, the way that they, I don't know. I was expecting maybe a little bit better. I would say I don't want to go too, too hard on people's work though. I think it's a water balloon that someone put inside of a bottle. <laughs> So we're going to be um, 
looking at some different kind of bubble stuff. So in the Discord, uh, I think it was uh, Billy's, Billy's Lol 09. Um, he was asking or, or talking about doing some different kind of bubble based effects. Um, figured it was a good good day today to kind of take a look at some new, new techniques or just uh, look at some new stuff. So there's different ways to to approach all of it. This, I feel like this one, the breakdown, <laughs> this is like a rare, oh, I, I don't know how rare it is, but it's one of the situations. Oh, you worked with him? Is, is this, this guy posts on Odd Force as well? Or I don't know, there's another guy who, the noob sections on the Discord. <laughs> Eddie section, we're, we're all noobs. We're all uh, noobs in certain uh, territories and, and skills, I'm sure. So, um, the custom solver guy on Odd Force. Yeah, I think like this sparse breakdown things look pretty cool. I'd like, I'd like to see a little bit of like, I don't know, these things feel a little too round or spherical to me, but but overall, I mean, this looks pretty good. But I, I was gonna say this is one of the uh, times where like the breakdown is almost more impressive than the actual effect. Like if you really know what you're doing with um, debugging and stuff like that, you can make your your simulation breakdowns or like uh, technical process like Getting a job, I think that's usually, I don't know, 25 or 50 percent of the the thing. Yeah, it's it's pretty cool to uh, with the way that Houdini has. You think he's doing it with micro solvers, or it's like completely uh, HDK um, stuff set aside. But uh, yeah, we're gonna be trying all micro solvers. Yeah. So that's a, one of the really nice things with Houdini. Um, if you go to the, they have a really old masterclass that's called Building Solvers from Scratch. Jeff Light, he's like the main um, engineer who designed DOPS and all the simulation stuff inside of Houdini. Um, in this, I mean, this is a really good um, masterclass to look at even if you're just getting started with fields in DOPS and like the, the concept of solving and everything like that. Um, he'll go over some of the like mathematic or textbook terminology and then kind of translate it into computer graphics terms. So like this is, that was like voxel based and particle based simulations. Um, he talks about like sign distance fields and, and what they represent. The Recording for this is a bit odd because it like zooms in and out or whatever. So sometimes it's hard to follow But he'll show you how to like build a, a your own kind of solver just using micro solvers and and go over all that stuff It's pretty cool Yeah, I saw there was a Russian guy who did that. I think he like rebuilt the the smoke solver or something like that um, Those are I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of hesitant about using them in production sometimes because I wouldn't want like another artist to pick up that setup and then it's like, it's just frustrating if you get like setups that are super re-engineered of the, like, even if you get something that's like 20 wrangles, that's doing something that already can be done quite easily using like built-in nodes, it's frustrating because you have to like look through all the code and make sure it's doing what you think it's doing and everything like that. Uh, but in terms of learning and just like understanding Houdini and more about math and effects and all that stuff, it's, it's really good to, to look at these tutorials and, and all that stuff. Um, yeah, so we'll be getting into some of this bubble stuff. So that was one uh, kind of reference or the one idea behind everything. Um, there's also this thing that I saw today. This is like a real life photography or whatever, but um, this is, I think, from the shooting of one of the Avatar sequels. So it's all pretty cool to see like a wind tunnel type effect, but underwater almost. Um, once you look at enough underwater bubble 
stuff, it's you start to see like a, it's very similar to the way that pyro or smoke simulations behave. Um, just because all of those things are are fluids, they all move according to the same rules of um, like non-divergent. Um, basically, like the velocities, the, the motion of everything looks the same because it's the same forces at work, the same equations being solved or just the same physics essentially. So it's just a pretty cool thing that I saw a little earlier today. Um, this was also one that I saw that's, this one's a bit old, but it still looks pretty cool. It's like three years old. Um, so I think this is just a pretty straightforward, uh, like RBD simulation with the flip tank. So we might start out with something like this and then uh, move on to the more advanced like bullet uh, shots that are going underwater or whatever. Um, hey, Julian, good to see you. Yeah, so I guess we'll get started. Let, let me... Um, we do a, a couple more updates. <laughs> Sorry, delaying a little bit here. So I, I kept working too on this powder guy that's falling apart. So I started putting him more in like a proper um, environment or, or whatever. Like uh, these are like piles of, of sand or something like that. Um, I'm still playing around with the camera angles and lighting and stuff like that a little bit. It's the cocaine, <laughs> the cocaine god. Um, but, but yeah, I'm still, still, still kind of retiming stuff and putting, putting things together, but I'm, I'm liking, like, starting to feel a little bit more, more polished or something closer to, to, um, to finished or, or finalized or whatever. So I think I had one as well that, yeah, this one plays a little bit longer. Yeah, so I'm still working on that. Hopefully I'll, I'll have that finished somewhat soon. Um, so if you go, that's actually one of my older streams from, uh, from um, the 12th of, uh, of this month. So I, I uh, Arme, good to see you. So I talk a little bit about it, but basically using attributes, I'm controlling um, the attraction weight or how um how strong they they cling together and you can kind of like paint or create procedural noises that um basically you kind of pre-fracture the grains it's using vellum grains um so you you kind of assign patterns to them that that uh, tell it how strong to stick together or how easily they can fall apart so doing that just using the bounding box of his head um I just did a ramp that, that uh, makes it like the top of his head will stick together, but the bottom is, is easier to crumble and fall apart and stuff like that. Uh, Julian's asking how many grain particles? I think that that one was maybe like 12, somewhere around 12 or 16 million. Um, and then I did a few sub steps on the DOP network and everything. I think it wasn't the simulation time was definitely less than a minute. It might've been like somewhere 10 to, to 20 seconds per frame for the, the simulation. But um, I think Vellum Grains, like all the grain stuff is OpenCL based. So it's pretty pretty efficient uh, when you have that toggle turned on and everything. Uh, yeah, and then just with bubbles, this was some older stuff that I had sitting around. Um, just wanted to show it. We were talking about bubbles and stuff like that. This is like a concept I did a while back, for, never turned into anything. It was, it was more of like a pitch for an Under Armour um, job or something like that. So this was their their logo, like you have a waterproof product or something like that. Um, so it's their, their logo just turning into bubbles, basically. This was um, actually a pyro simulation, like smoke simulation. Um, so that's what I was saying earlier with the avatar stuff. Like 
I'm just taking the density field, converting it to uh, a mesh using the VDB tools and stuff like that. And then all these little bubbles are extra particles that are advected or, or moved with the pyro velocity field. So you, once you know, like overall the motion's the same and stuff like that, you can get good results out of good bubble, like underwater bubble results with uh, the pyro solver. It's all just air, whether it's air outside of the water or underwater, it still, it still moves around the same. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to, to show that. So we'll get, get going with some Houdini stuff. So the, uh, thank you. you like the splash screen? It's like all the other uh, 3D software packet that you made the meme, like uh, maybe, let's think, this, this was Soft Image, this is Maya, this is 3DS Max, Cinema 4D, this one's, uh, I don't know, Lightwave. <laughs> They're all trying to, to catch up to, to Houdini. Um, yeah, so j I just wanted to um, start off with just some SOP based ideas and stuff like that. Talking just about like bubble, the bubble process and some ideas with it. So we'll just do a box. Yeah, I remember it's going to a SIG graph and it was the last year that Lightwave was around and then their booth, they, it was interesting because they had gone like all out. They spent a ton of money. They had like a super big booth built out with all the fancy lighting and stuff like that. And then like two months later, it was just, <laughs> just gone. I think the, the worst is Soft Image because like that was actually pretty powerful in terms of Techn technically like being close to Houdini and like building your own stuff and everything. You do a lot of things with the soft image. So I just convert the, the box, bounding box or whatever to a volume so I can scatter uh, points inside of it. Um, and then I'll just make sure that these are like more random. We'll just do 25. Uh, we'll do an an another randomize. And with this one, do P scale. And just do ramp with one, one dimension, just single scale value. So we have particles and we have P scale. And then we'll copy to points. It looks like overall my P scale is a bit too big. Um, you can either do this like global scale, or sometimes I use these fit functions. So that just means after the result of this ramp, remap this value to this new range. So like maybe we only want the smallest ones to be 0 0.05, and then the biggest ones to be 0.1, maybe let the smaller ones get a little bit smaller. Uh, but this way you aren't like, trying to bake in a minimum. Like sometimes I see people use the ramp this way and trying to set this, but then you're kind of just like, you have less area of the ramp or whatever to work with. And then this is a little bit more clear. I don't know, it just depends, it's up to you. Um, and maybe we want to do another noise. So you just do attribute noise. And this is additive, so it means it just takes the current value and uh, adds this noise value to it. So instead of adding to the color attribute, we can just add directly to the P attribute. Um, you see everything shifts kind of up and to the right. Um, so that's because this noise is not centered at zero. It's like all generating positive numbers. So if you do center noise, then this noise will just move things like in 3D between negative numbers and positive numbers. Um, and then if I just do animated, 
then we can offset or evolve the noise over time. Usually once I start working with time, I'll expand the time bar in my scene, turn on the, the real time playback just to get a better sense of like what, what is actually, what the animation actually looks like if I were to render it and everything like that. Um, then maybe something like that, some, some bubbles hanging out and things. Wow. Super question from someone who isn't a Houdini user yet. But why does your Houdini look so nice and flat? Is it a theme? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm, enjoy I'm glad you uh, enjoy the way my Houdini looks. So yeah, so basically I've kind of customized it. I haven't tried to go too overboard with things. Um, but it's essentially a theme uh, that's the color scheme. And then there's some additional options and stuff like that that I've set within Houdini that, that make it look this way. So if you go to edit, color settings, um, you can find like themes online here if you download stuff. Uh, you, people can also share them online. They're, they're just config files and stuff like that. So with this slate theme, this basically is like rep, rec, uh, recreating or whatever the, yeah, I like slate. It's kind of like when you notice when like iOS and Android and all those people switched, they got rid of like the gradients and, and shading on all their UI elements. So that's the main reason I switched to Slate, just so it's like a flat UI kind of. Um, and then I've also just done things with these nodes to turn off like rounded edges. Um, I also turned off like the node ring. Usually this, this thing will pop up, but the, to me, this is just like redundant. Like, each of these radial things correspond to a flag, so it's just too busy to like display information twice or whatever. But once you start using Houdini enough or whatever, I don't know, you'll find certain things you want to change about it. So it's nice that it's pretty open-ended when it comes to UI, and you can even like design your own nodes. You could have them all be circles, a bunch of crazy stuff, all that. Your noodles are round. <laughs> you like that? I'm not a fan of these these ones just because I find that like any configuration I get with this, things get overlapping too much or whatever. Um, so I, I was doing it like this, your, your rounded noodles, the ramen noodles. So I was, um, even back in the day, you used to be able to make your nodes skinnier, like, um, so, and dots. I, I don't like using dots. I don't know. It's like a, <laughs> It's another weird thing. Um, so the, uh, back in the day, I used to have these weird chunky square <laughs> nodes and I was a big fan of them. But uh, yeah, I'm always just kind of messing around with the, the UI and stuff like that. So get back into the, the effect. Um, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about like procedural bubbles. Um, it's always good to be able to turn like points, basically like a particle simulation into, into realistic looking bubbles. So that's what I'm gonna do here. Um, so we just have points with the P scale. I've animated the position just through a noise field. So they're kind of undulating or hanging out or whatever. Um, and then instead of primitives, you look at wireframe view, like this is kind of like a NURBS surface or it's not really polygons or faces, quads, or anything like that. Um, so if I just do polygon, then we'll actually get like triangles that we can deform and distort and stuff like that. Um, then if I do an attribute bop underneath, uh, this way, maybe try anti-alias noise. Um, We'll have it generate a 3D noise. So this box, if you guys, if anyone isn't familiar with it, it's one of the main like powerful aspects of Houdini. Uh, it looks a lot like the Maya shader editor or any shader editor with other software. It's the same idea that you're using procedural noises and textures and stuff like that. But instead of just being able to use it at render time, you can kind of add shaders or little code 
operations to to your geometry and do displacements and, and things like that that other software packages you'd only be able to do at the shader level but the shader time or render time but Houdini you kind of have all access to everything um, I'm just adding a 3d noise to these guys um, maybe we want it to be a little less strong then you kind of see that as these things move around the noise field um, they look like they're actually undulating like a, a bubble isn't perfectly round usually unless if they get small enough those are usually like perfectly round but once they start to get big like just different densities or something happens with the water where it pushes on it differently um, you see just some like undulations or, or distortions or stuff like that um, so instead of taking like the current have them swimming through the noise position basically um, one thing that is super useful is if you like negate or invert the position so it's kind of hard to see but if you look closely like now it appears that they're shearing through the noise pattern a little bit. Um, whereas before with it off, this looks a little less natural kind of. But if you flip the, the coordinates around, like as this one goes up, it looks a lot more like a bubble. Like bloop, 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 bloop. <laughs> So this is a, a very useful kind of hack or cheat code or whatever for making just procedural bubbles. Um, one thing I can do as well is like, just disable that noise for a second. And then <laughs> you're here just for the cheats. <laughs> so yeah, so this is just a, a very super simple thing. Like it's nice because any software package or any animation you're doing, even with like other software packages, it's a trick you can always use is just to to flip your noise coordinates around or invert them, essentially. Um, so again, what I did here is just disabled the noise, like the, the points were undulating around or moving around in. Um, so they're just, if I play, nothing's moving. Now I'm just gonna add to the Y um, vector of the position time. So again, if I don't, negate things it just looks like everything's moving kind of the other direction um let me take this so if you were to just ask someone kind of what direction these look like i don't know i would say that they probably look like they're going down well once i negate now it looks like they're kind of moving more up i would say it's a it's kind of something that's very subtle, but um, I don't know. It's, a, it's something that always makes a, a bit of a difference to me. Um, and then these all right now are going through the same like uniform noise. So you can tell that there's a little bit of like cohesion or whatever. Uh, if you want to get rid of that, you could just go to polygon soup. So now we have 25 polygon soups where if we do polygons, um, each of these triangles is its own uh, polygon. So you don't have as much like flexibility, basically. If I do a random um, color based off of the primitive number, let me just set this to color. Then we have the rainbow effect. But if I switch this to polygon soup, then each bubble gets its own color because each one is has its own polygon soup that it uh, is is a part of. So that makes this primitive number much more useful for certain things. Like I could take this and instead of having it be output as the color, um, you could just add it here to the source um, as like an offset to the noise position. So each bubble or each polygon soup now has its own, um, I don't know if that uptime, I don't have my bot set up to recognize that, that command. You have, you have a special 
command you're trying to uh, to query. So uh, one thing I can do is just multiply this random number by um, a big, uh, a larger number so that each of these bubbles is basically getting its own offset through the noise pattern. So instead of without this, um, does it does it not show the stream time underneath the uh, the the, the, uh, on the Twitch UI? Should get my Streamlabs set up to recognize that command. So without this offset applied, you can see everything's looks like it has its own uniform kind of force that it's going through. But with it, these bubbles will now behave like a little bit more like individual uh, forces are, are acting upon them. And then if you wanted to, you could further um, randomize things like maybe the amplitude of noise per, per bubble, you could have that varied um, and just all sorts of things like that. So maybe this time, value here was just a bit too quick for the overall like undulation of everything. So maybe this is a little bit um, somewhat more realistic. Sometimes with this noise, you get some like flattening, like it won't always preserve the volume. So some, sometimes you get into a, a bit of a trouble, but just this is just like not not for an entire bubble effect, but this is something that you would just add to the little bubbles that might be floating around your your actual like simulated bubbles, if that makes sense. Uh, you can also maybe do curl noise, and you don't want to do both of them. Just replace it, and then you just have to make the amplitude and stuff smaller with this one. Maybe we want the. Noise type to be this simplex. I usually find the analytic noise, uh, curl noises are better than the regular ones. So sometimes with curl noise, these will generally do a better job at preserving the volume of the bubbles. Um, and curl noise in general does more a better job at like replicating fluid forces or, or fluid dynamics. So I usually prefer to use them when I'm doing Kind of fluid, like trying to recreate fluid forces essentially. So this is a pretty cool, cool trick or whatever, cool technique, um, just for doing, adding like a procedural look to particles basically. Anytime you're making a bunch of bubbles, you usually end up representing them as individual, or at least the really small ones, individual particles until like render time or whatever. But this way you can just up res them or add a little bit of extra interest to them. So we'll save this, um, just make a new stream folder. This is, what is this, 24th? This will just be um, bubbles, maybe underwater. version one. Let's go back, maybe look at some more references and stuff like that. Um, I have this old Tumblr <laughs> blog website thing. Um, I like to use it sometimes because you can search it like, you just modify the URL here. Let me put this in the chat. Um, the last slash, if you just put on whatever tag or category you want to fil filter by, um, that will let, like I've basically gone through and tagged certain things like pyro, um, bubble, iridescence, waves, ocean, water. So you can append, kind of use this as a search function or, or a uh, kind of filter parameter. Um, so if you do bubbles, this will just narrow it down. Um, there's like GIF animations and stuff like that. So I don't know how often you're looking for effects references, but usually find this to be a pretty 
pretty easy way of just going through a bunch of different things and just quickly looking around, finding things of different scale, different compositions and different interests or whatever and stuff like that. You quickly find underwater bubbles, air bubbles. This is kind of what I was talking about with that procedural noise. Like if someone had wanted you to make this effect with within an afternoon, like we need this by lunchtime. I don't know why, but we, we need it immediately. Um, you might just decide to completely forgo performing a simulation and um, you could just get something close to this pretty quickly with like a particle emitter layering the noise on top and, and get something pretty nice. Something maybe like this, they give you a week to do it or two weeks or something. You have more time to actually do a simulation. You'll get better like distributions maybe and, and density and stuff like that. This is another one too that's like a, one of the underwater ones. It's pretty fast, so you get pretty... Um, it's very close to a pyro or gas simulation, I would say, where it's like you very clearly see the air that was trapped to his talons. This is like a bird, like shoving his feet under the water or whatever. Um, and you can kind of see how this is behaving much more like a pyro simulation um, than an actual like flip simulation. So sometimes if you're doing really bubbly like air like that, just doing the pyro simulation is better. This is another one that almost looks more like a pyro simulation than, than flip or whatever. It's pretty cool. So we'll just dive dive in, play around here a bit. Um, just name this procedural noise bubbly distortion. So I'll just do some stuff here at object level. Um, make a sphere. Sometimes when I'm playing around with flips and particle stuff, um, if I'm just playing around with ideas to get things done quickly, I'll just use shelf tools. <clears throat> so I'll start with um, rigid body, RBD, just for this ball. Um, you should be good with that. Falls down, it's working all right. Um, we're probably also gonna want a static object, like a ground plane for it to, to fall down on top of or start inside of. Um, and then particle fluids, I'll just do the flip tank. And then with this one, uh, I'll just usually press enter. So that will go ahead and just put it directly at the origin. So we have everything that's all stacked up on each other, uh, but sometimes I'll, I don't prefer to work at the object level like this, but it's sometimes just a quick way to test out simulations. Like I'll see if basically a method of, of doing something is a viable approach. If it is, then I'll take the time to like rebuild it in SOPs uh, organized and, and more properly and stuff like that. I'm just not a big fan, like it's a little redundant to have all these different object containers for like initial results inside fluid, outside fluid, it just gets a bit messy or whatever. Um, so our ball, I'm just going to go in here and lift it up a little bit. Maybe 1.5 units, so it has some space to fall down. Um, then if I go inside of the DOP network, everything here is a bit of a mess. Sometimes just starting out, I'll press the L button. It's just a hotkey. It's like an abbreviation of layout, essentially. Um, for small networks like this, it will do a good job of just spacing everything out. If you have like a SOP network that you've been carefully organizing, it will generally just turn that into more of a mess than, than a nice... <laughs> clean organized tree but for simple things like this it, it usually works quite well 
Um, and then my ground plane, if I take that, I'm just gonna move it down. So it looks like I can't move it right now because it's linked to the object. So if I go to that object, is this set with a, I guess I just have to do it at the object level. <clears throat> so I think the bottom of my flip tank might be, let me just pin my view into in this DOF network so I can see that, that wireframe and stuff. Um, so I think I'm like negative 2.5 units. I think the, the flip tank will be five meters or five units tall to start with. So if we go ahead and play stuff now, we have a narrow band simulation. That's the way that the um, shelf tools set up the flip tank or whatever. Sometimes depends what you're trying to do. Like the, the narrow band works quite well now for a lot of different things. But if you do want to go back to the, the older style or just the dense tank, um, if you go to the flip tank node that gets created under initial data, you can switch it to particle field. And then you'll have like a, instead of narrow band, you'll have the entire tank um, being simulated. So I might want to play around with this um, dimensions of the tank a little bit. So I'm just gonna go to the node that creates it. Uh, everything uses these ocean source nodes now. Maybe my vertical size, I'm gonna make that 10 units high. Um, so we have more of a volume or whatever to for the, the ball to fall into. Maybe I might even go a little bit bigger with that. Let's do 20, maybe 15. And then this <clears throat> ground plane, um, just need to, I think, go to 7.5, negative 7.5. So just half of 15, essentially. All right. Now we could play things again. Sometimes inside of here, I'll turn off the other objects. Um, I don't know why this... So it looks like this is showing two different geometries or whatever, and that's why it looks like the, the weird air or whatever. Um, or you just set it to render geometry, or just turn that off to fix that part of it. Maybe, uh, I don't know. Something needs to happen for it to appear on the first frame. I'm not gonna worry about it right now. Um, so we have it. it, goes sploosh, falls into the tank, and that's that's all that happens. Um, but it's good to check just, just to make sure the simulation is working. One thing I might do is, um, going to go a little bit higher with the particle separation just just so we're working a little bit more quickly so if we want to we could change the way that this ball behaves like right now um, the, the ball isn't being affected by the water at all if we want that the, the ball to, to be affected by this flip. This merge is already set to mutual, so all of these things will be mutually affecting each other. Sometimes if it's like left affects right, then this flip would never affect the ball. But it's set to mutual, but things aren't um, still mutually affecting. So to have that set up, if you just go to the solver tab under volume motion, they have this feedback scale, um, and that's basically how much of an effect the fluid will have on rigid body objects or other objects. I think with like cloth and other stuff as well, this, this feedback scale applies. So if 
this is like a scale on the differences of mass and everything like that. Um, so if you change the mass of your RBDs, that will also have an effect on things. But now with this feedback scale 2.73 or whatever, um, you can see we're getting something that quickly dips, but then the buoyancy or whatever, the difference in, in mass or density um, causes this to float on top of the water. So if you have RBD or, or things like that, um, yeah, I'll go a little bit into the meshing, the flip. Um, yeah, it, it depends. I don't have a workflow that I always use for every circumstance, um, but I'll be meshing some flip for sure. Sometimes you get a ball that it will roll like this bullet sometimes has some problems or it's just hard to art direct. So you might want to um, use forces or things like that at a certain point. So you could constrain things or like the pop soft limits or pop attract to make sure that it just stays in the center. Um, Cause those pop forces will work with the packed RBD quite well. So like we were doing with the PlayStation effect, um, they have this pop limit. I could set like my um, X and Y parameters or whatever to be in this area. Um, see, see how well this works. But this, if you really had like an art director or someone that wanted something floating or bobbing in the middle of your, your fluid tank, uh, this might be one approach to, to doing that. So I think basically this is going to apply the centroid or the pivot position of the ball, um, just because all this RBD stuff is treated like a single point in space. It might actually be killing outside, so we maybe we want to turn that off. Um, turn on closed ends, maybe. This should work this time. Black Uku, how's it going? Get the, the Kim emote going? I actually installed some some new ones, but <laughs> I think it might be like a different, I don't have enough slots yet that I could put it in a lower tier. Um, let me, I think I need to refresh. Maybe it's still not showing up right now. But you could see this is, um, now the ball is staying inside of this box because we've basically limited or clamped the position at a certain uh, area. So if you really need something to float, you could add extra forces or constraints or stuff to do that. Um, you can play around with this feedback scale to get whatever kind of result you're after. Maybe it just depends on the type of uh, material or RBD that you're, you're thinking this is. Like if it's concrete, you would expect it to go all the way down. If it's like a rubber ducky or something like that, you'd expect it to uh, to float on top. But even even this with its higher than zero, you'll get some resistance and some motion and stuff like that as it drops down. You can, I think, find a sweet spot where it will like fall down a little bit and then shoot back up or, or fly back up or whatever. I think as a rule of thumb, like the way that the defaults are set up, anything, a feedback scale of less than one will sink. Um, yeah, the, the mass or density are basically just additional multipliers that, that override or change this value, but they're, they're helpful to use because you can change it on a per object basis. So if, if you have a house, like made out of planks of wood and then uh, cinder blocks. You could set, set up the masses or densities such that the cinder blocks or concrete um, sinks to the bottom of your flip, but the wood planks or lighter materials uh, kind of dip under and then rise back to the surface or, or whatever you want to do. Uh, so that's a useful way to, to approach that part of it.
And then if you want to add bubbles to this, the easiest, like most straightforward way of doing that is just with the white water tool. So if I click that, this will basically add another, um, <laughs> hey, uh, so that will add another simulation. I think I just need to, it's saying select the uh, fluid. So I think I can just highlight this and press enter. And what this does is add another simulation. So it adds this whitewater source, whitewater sim, whitewater import. Um, so now we're doing two simulations at once. If you look at just this result, what this is basically doing is adding, um, we kind of have this kind of simulation going on now. So in this example, the feedback scale or density is set a little bit different. So that the ball always sinks, but just in terms of results and stuff like that happening, we have something similar to this. Um, if you want to really get deep into bubbles and custom solvers and stuff like that, another good, it's pretty old at this point, but um, Houdini has some different river simulations and stuff like that that they've set up. Um, there was an old kind of masterclass or or um, tutorial that they did that was like a riverbed type thing. It might have been like Houdini 12 or 13. Like it was pretty old, but this was before the whitewater solver and they actually show you how to build this kind of setup from scratch. <laughs> John's water balls. So like if you're really looking to, I don't know, the, people of all different skill levels and stuff like that. Uh, I don't think it's the Spence Looter one. Um, I could actually find it. It's like a side effects. Um, yeah, I'm, I don't think it's this. I mean, this one they they make. I, I, it was Scott Keating that does it. Um, but I don't know. It seems like. Side effects uh, is like purged this from from existence. I think I found a, a trace of it on the internet. Um, so this this one is from a long time ago, but if you really are wondering about like white water and how how, how this stuff is built, he he builds the kind of the white water solver from scratch. Or there's there's a lot of interesting things happening. Um, he uses like the SDF surface from the fluid to have the um, particles float on top and everything. Yeah, I could send the link. Um, maybe just the Vimeo. If you look, there's places where uh, they, they provided the hip files and everything, I believe. Um, and this was a two part tutorial where the second part he he does the rendering like lighting setup even using the fur or hair utility to build grass like it's pretty it was one of the really good tutorials when i was learning houdini at the start um the pop the particles is like the older it's before they <laughs> they switched the way that they were doing particles or whatever so some some of this stuff might not be that great but like the the things that he does with volume gradient and volume sample like if you want to know how to build a whitewater bubble solver from scratch, the, this one's a pretty pretty cool one to look at. Um, but basically, if you're you don't care that much about the technical aspects, like doing things this way with the whitewater solver, this is a good starting point to to build a bubble to add bubbles to your simulation or whatever. Um, so. If you were to, if you were needing to render this very quickly and turn things into bubbles, um, uh, 
I don't know. I don't know if I'm gonna do this one. So I'm, I'm just gonna save this. Just save this as version two. Um, I'm gonna go into a different uh, tutorial or a different step now for, for doing bubbles and meshing and things like that. We'll just do a new scene file. Um, this time I'll just do a box. And uh, change the dimensions of it a little bit. So we'll make it a, a bit flat and then a bit thin. So it's like a bar or a, a sliver more. Um, and then this time I'll do a viscous fluid. And I think we can just do... I don't know, maybe. <laughs> I'm gonna make it viscous, but maybe I'm just gonna start with um, emit fluid emit particle fluid. You just select the object, hit enter, um, hit enter again, so it will make the fluid flip. This is basically saying, do you want to add this as an emitter to an existing fluid simulation, or just press enter again to initialize a new one. Um, and then it looks like everything disappeared. possible it doesn't like me scaling the box at the object level. I think that might be the case. So I'll just go back and undo that step. You think my particle separation is too high such that it's not creating any particles? We got some. How did this box get so small? <laughs> I guess the default fluid tank is pretty uh, pretty big. It's also the way that that gets de determined is on volume motion. Basically, this is maximum uh, sizes. So I'll go into my box now and just make the same thinness. Thank you for that assistance, Arma. Um, so now we have a, a more of a sliver. Um, I could add a ground plane. I'm just gonna switch the relationship around um, and move this down a couple units. All right. Um, so basically what I'm going to do is convert this into like a more of a honey or a syrup or a drizzle or something like that. So on the flip fluid object, um, you would add viscosity attribute. And on the um, viscosity tab of volume motion, you can enable viscosity. Um, I could enable by attribute. Under physical, there's viscosity as well. Um, I, I might actually not, I'm not gonna add the viscosity attribute. I'm not gonna do that. Um, I'm just going to en enable viscosity and then I'll be controlling viscosity on the physical parameter of my flip object. So I'm just going to try a value of 10. Um, you'd see where our particles are sticking together now, but they're still kind of spreading out and flattening out a little bit more um, when they hit the surface. So our fluid's becoming a little bit thicker. Maybe this is like pancake batter or something, like the, the thickness or viscosity of that. Um, but if you want more of like a honey or um, syrup or something like that should be more viscosity, more stiffness, just more resistance when you're making the fluid. So now you can see it's 
starting to stack up a little bit more. Um, this still looks a little bit too thin to me. This is like you're melting chocolate, like a fondue fountain or something like that. Um, so maybe even higher for, for the viscosity. So now it's retaining its shape a little bit more and, and stacking up and stuff like that. Um, if you get, I don't know if I need more particles or a thinner thing, but you can start to get like the coiling action kind of where this will flip back and forth really quickly to like layer, layer things up. It looks pretty good. I'm probably not going to be able to get that that easily right now but um basically if i had a very thin kind of sheet let's see i should maybe be able to get closer to that kind of result Might be some options on the solver I can change. Um, I think with viscosity, if you turn on OpenCL, it can help with that. Uh, the speed of the like pressure uh, projection will converge more quickly, or a little bit more optimized with um, with it. Sometimes switching to the swirly kernel is better for for this kind of viscous fluids and stuff. So I'm also going to turn on ID attribute. Um, so basically when you, when you have reseeding turned on that will, the solver will add or delete particles throughout the simulation uh, to try to keep them like evenly spaced out. So if you add the ID attribute, then you'll keep track of like the particle index or whatever. So the, the point count won't be changing, it will be fixed. So I'm just going to go in as well at the this level. Um, I'm just going to add some some animation to make it quicker to get like the result I'm trying to get. I think I can do this. If I do this after the surface creation, uh, it might be a little bit more optimized. Um, so under translate the z direction, I'm just going to do a sign function on the frame number, the floating frame number. So if you look, this is just a procedural animation that will ease the emitter back and forth. Um, if I multiply that by a higher number, then that animation will happen at a higher frequency. And then if I want less of that, I can just divide the results by a number, maybe 10. So now we, we have 10% of that original amplitude or strength. So this is kind of if you have like a fancy dessert chef, maybe they know these these skills to uh, move their their candy devices or frosting things around or whatever to get interesting uh, patterns. And then under rotate or Y, uh, I'll just maybe try chef coons, <laughs> chef kiss coons. Um, we'll try maybe this kind of spinning translational motion or whatever. So, so now um, our, our spraying shape or honey pourer, we're doing like a fancy uh, motion with it or whatever. Um, so what I'm gonna go over, we'll just let this, I'm just gonna click here to, to have it simulate further into the simulation. Um, and what we'll do is basically create air bubbles inside of our flow using just the information that we have within the simulation. So basically any flip simulation, if you want to embed or have 
air bubbles inside of it. One of the easiest ways, and this is why I added that ID attribute, you can just delete things by an ID threshold to keep 5% or 1% of the flip particles. And then you can basically just turn those into, into bubbles or copy spheres onto them and render them that way so that you're saying, put bubbles inside of it or just treat this fluid like it has X amount of bubbles inside of it, essentially. So it looks like our simulation is like halfway. Kind of, it's kind of like deleting pockets of the fluid. Um, looks like we have enough of, of our simulation. Let me just turn off that. Under volume simulation, turn off those visualization of the domain. Um, so if we go into particle fluid, this will set up some stuff. You could kind of ignore it or just go straight to the particle fluid surface. Yeah, I, I think by, I don't know, what what is this? A million particles is faster on yours. It might be my CPU isn't, uh, isn't as good for doing flip simulations as it is for pyro. Um, I could turn off, I'm gonna uncheck the material thing for right now. And so the default particle fluid surface method of meshing things is pretty good. Um, all the options and stuff like that is pretty, pretty straightforward. Oh, uh, it might just be slow for everyone. I mean, it's a, uh, the viscosity is pretty slow and then it generally is just a little, <laughs> it's a second. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna switch the frames. That's not as, uh, <laughs> just happened to be a, a weird moment of the simulation. <laughs> so this particle fluid surface is a good starting point for, for meshing fluids, but I could also go into um, <laughs> it's like the cross between a tongue and a sack. It's a very weird form right now. This, yeah, the steppy pattern is because I'm moving the emitter faster than my sub steps, basically. Um, you clean it up if you want, or you, there's other, there might be other ways to fix it if you like smear your source so that it's, it's uh, trailing, it's like blurred a little bit or whatever. Um, but I'm just gonna leave it for right now. Um, you could look inside of the the flip object and stuff. Like it's pretty easy to, to deconstruct how their ID attribute is generated. Um, so I think we're, we're done. All right, so this is what I was talking about. I was just trying to get somewhat of an interesting shape so that it was layering or building uh, a structure on itself. Um, so I'll just go into this quickly um, regarding the ID attribute. Eh, it's not as, it's not as poopy. This is like a, a jam, like a strawberry jam maybe or something like that. <laughs> Certain angles, it looks more like poop. Maybe this looks a little bit more appetizing. It should probably be a little bit thinner and it would look better. Um, so very quickly, just about the ID attribute. You go into the DOP network, you make uh, the pop source, not pop solver, pop source. Um, you double click on this go into the SOP solver. You could look at how they're storing uh, the ID attribute uh, basically, they have a detail attribute that's called next ID that's telling it when it creates more particles, start from this number. So it will always just any new any new ID attributes it creates won't be intersecting or won't be overlapping with the existing ones. Um, so this that's basically the, the underlying method that it knows how to create things. Um, if you look at the source volume source. This is the newer node that they use even for source fluids or source flip. So we'll make the particles. 
Um, and then the same idea with this source particles. They're doing a, a similar thing to keep track of the next ID. Um, age and life IDs this is one of the nice things about Houdini. Like other solvers with real flow and stuff, you wouldn't necessarily be able to, to see how they're keeping track of ID. But that's basically how they keep track of the particle IDs with uh, Houdini. If you dig enough and pick apart their tools and stuff, then you can see how they're, what smart logic they've done to, to figure things out. <clears throat> so we'll just go into surfacing this pretty quickly. Um, if you're doing this by yourself or like you don't want to use the built-in particles uh, fluid surface node, you can just do VDB from particles. Um, then you just have to make sure the minimum radius is low enough. Uh, and then if you convert back to polygons, this is generally, usually I just do soup. This is the way that they are doing everything. There's a lot more nodes and stuff like that happening inside of here for collisions and, and extra things, but the overall logic is generally just stamp these particles into a VDB and then convert them back to polygons. So this voxel size, they've usually linked it up to like your particle separation scale on the flip. So you could get more resolution or more detail by reducing the voxel size. Um, you could additionally like make your particles less, more or less dense, depending on, um, not more or less dense, but this is just how, how, how big or the radius of them, it will treat them as when it converts them into a volume. So if you want a super blobby fluid, you go higher with the particle scale. Um, there's also the filtering operations that are pretty nice. So if you do reshape SDF, then you can erode or dilate your fluid. Um, usually, sometimes you see this point right here if you're doing extra, uh, like your custom approach. Basically that happens because the volumes get treated like individual points. So with a blast, if you do at name equals asterisk, um, basically what this will do is delete any of the volumes. So surface uh, velocity X, Y, and Z, uh, we just eliminate them and say don't include them. So that's why sometimes you see the one one point that's always sitting at the origin like that, if you're going like custom or whatever. So th we're basically saying only flip particles. So you can do dilate that will make things thicker. You could do erode. Sometimes maybe with this erode, I need more of a bandwidth. Maybe this was too big of a number. I don't know how this got so, um, so thin or so, so uh, like Swiss cheese. Usually this, this, um, E road works better. Sometimes. I'll do VDB from polygons. Um, if you link both of those wires up, it will basically just say match the voxel scale of the source input. Um, so it looks like nothing's happening like visually, but basically this is kind of renormalizing or rebuilding the SDF to make sure the inside and the outside are um, contained. Like sometimes if you have holes, on the inside, uh, this reshape doesn't work as well. So I think that's the case, was that there was like some gaps or bubbles or whatever uh, trapped inside of it. It was messing up the erosion process.
So it looks like it got a little thin in that area. If I want, um, I could reduce the voxel size. And then you can do a BDB smooth SDF. Um, it depends where you want to do it, either before or after this erosion or dilation or whatever operation you're doing. This way you can kind of flatten out the uh, surface or get it. Makes a big difference depending on what type of stuff you're rendering, but like honey or things like that, you want it to look really like smooth or glassy. Um, so this can be a big, big help with that. Uh, no, it doesn't break things. Like, I don't know. The way that I view meshing is that after after the simulation, it's all artistic. It's all like whatever you think looks best. Um, whatever operations you want to do is all it's all fair game. Um, it can. I mean, it can break things if you aren't if you're setting up the resolution to be too too different, but. For the most part, it, it doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah, don't don't worry about getting stuck, like thinking because you simulated at uh, a certain resolution, you have to mesh things that way. I think it's kind of misleading because on this node, they've set it up like, so basically what they did is, this is a reference to your simulation and then this is an additional multiplier to it. So this you're saying like work at a quarter uh, resolution of your simulation particle separ separation. Um, so that's what that's how they've set this node up, where you're basically saying match this value and then arbitrarily scale to be a higher, or lower resolution than that. Whereas this one here, I'm just starting with an arbitrary number that I could match or work at a higher or lower resolution than my flip simulation. Um, so this is looking pretty smooth. So if we want to add the bubbles, what what we could do is, I guess this wrangle is a good good place to start. Um, they have some presets here where like the relative reference, yeah, it throws you off because I mean, working this way, you don't necessarily want to change this directly. So this. Voxel scale is the same thing as like me going in here and saying like two times this. Setting this value to two is it's the same idea as doing that. These two values are linked in that in that manner. Uh, if that makes sense. So with this one, like this has these different presets you can use. Um, maybe point group based off threshold. Um, condition instead of based off of the position, what I could do is like a random number that gets generated from the ID attribute of the particle. Um, and then compare that with a threshold. So I'll just name that percent. So now you can see what what my parameter and what this is doing basically. Um, so this percent is saying how much of the flip particles to group or to delete. So we could do like 98, and I would say just keep or mark 2% of them red. Um, then if I really wanted to delete them, could go my group. And I think, so I think this is flipped around. Or I could go back. Maybe I like them colored red and then this way just delete non-selected. So maybe even more, even more. <laughs> All right, that's starting to look better. Um, so 
by deleting these based off of ID, they will always move with the simulation, like they're embedded or traveling with the motion of my, my flip simulation. Um, that's why I was sure to enable that to the toggle or that's why I was talking so much about it. You can see if I'm doing random number just based off of the point number because I'm always creating more points and the reseeding is happening, the point number is changing. So it's causing them to just randomly jitter or this gets selects different points every frame. So we do random number based off of ID and we, we get a smooth uh, kind of, I don't know, um, temporally co coherent selection, like over time from frame to frame, it remains the same or coherent. And then what I can do with these points, just do rename and uh, delete the color attribute. We still have some other things from the solver, but I'll just do this to get back to, to default. Uh, the next thing that I can do maybe is attribute from volume. And then what I'll do is just wire this all the way up to my import stop import node and volume that I want to import the attribute from will be the surface. And it doesn't look like anything happens. It just looks like they all turned black, but we look at the color, it's actually changing and it's like negative numbers that it all has. So we can do this wrangle again to invert or negate that value. Just do vector CD times equals negative one. Just invert it or flip it around. Um, if I change the exposure of my viewport, you could see it's like brighter or darker. Um, basically the surface volume that I'm sampling or transferring the attribute from is very useful because this is this value is actually a distance in worlds in like object space, which is the depth, like how far inside or outside of the surface you are. So it was always negative because all these points were inside of the surface. If um, before flipping this around, before sampling the volume or seeing what the current value was where these were occupied. If I jitter the points and randomize them, some of them are outside of the, the um, surface. Like the, the surface is basically where what's fluid and what isn't. Um, I'm just gonna visualize my VDB surface. So basically anything that's above one is outside of my flip. Um, so this is a really useful way of just grabbing whatever particles are outside if they have positive numbers. Um, or it's also useful because I can see the distance that they are from the surface. And maybe just to make sure things match up one to one, I can directly reference my um, VDB surface using, using these tools. Gonna get rid of that point jitter. Um, it's possible with this second time I do the VDB from polygons, I might want to fill interior. Sometimes you might miss, like, this will basically fill your entire VDB volume with values for being like the distance from the surface. It looks like it's not making a difference right now, so I'll just keep it the same. Um, so because this, like I've multiplied it by negative one, so now they should all be positive. Um, if they were negative, I could delete them or something like that. But what I can do with this, like I was saying, this is a distance value or it is a measurement. 
So if I copy spheres to the particles, um, what I could do is assign P scale to that value. You'd see some of the ones that flipped around because they got too close to the surface or whatever. So now you can see the ones that flipped around are outside. Um, so right here, if I wanted to, I could say blast. This one has already copied them, the value of the, the volume to the particles. And then I could delete them based off of uh, that attribute if it's bigger than zero. This is before we flip them around. And then you can see we've gotten rid of any of the ones that are too close to the surface. And because this value will always um, adjust, like any, any of these that get too close, they'll never stick through or they'll never penetrate. Um, so if I take this jitter and change the scale of, of things, you can see that they're automatically moving around or adjusting. Let me just, I'm not gonna do the color for now. So I'm not gonna transfer these, these uh, this long list of attributes that includes color or saying everything except all of these. Uh, so instead of moving color to the this copied spheres, just leave it, leave them white. You can see that with this system, as I'm moving things around, we only get a scale whenever things are inside of the fluid. And they'll always be uh, adjusted such that they fit inside or never stick out. So this is really useful for, for adding bubbles. Um, I might just make my resolution a little bit lower uh, just to get quicker playback or flipbooks or whatever. So the VDB meshing is always pretty slow. Um, it's, a, it's a bit of a pain because like these operations are depe very dependent on the resolution. So this one you can at least change it so that it's not based off of voxel size, but even with that, doing that, the results will still change quite a bit, depending on the resolution. Um, but I'm just trying to work a little bit quicker. So we'll go back to wireframe. Or we could also, uh, I think just with a wrangle, merge these two together. And then if you want to see this more like a fluid, sometimes I'll just set the alpha. It's like 0 0.5 or uh, something less than one. So this way you can see inside of it. And then, um, Should be playing back pretty quickly. Uh, I don't think you even have to, to Boolean. We'll try to do a quick flip book. So the way that renders and ray tracers and stuff like that work, um, when it's figuring out the surface, instead of thinking that it's exiting the, the backside, it will just keep going from basically whatever your, your, your fluid surface is to air when it's inside of the bubble and then back to um, the surface. So if you have two different indexes of refraction, the light will like continue to keep bending. Um, because all of this is polygons, you can just flip the faces around so that the bubbles are reversed and the renderer will be able to figure out what is, is going on with things, if that makes sense. Does that sound reasonable? <laughs> Yay or nay? So one of the things I think, um,
to to look up is this thing called like one one of the things at least called these nested dielectrics. Um, I think. Like with the Arnold's docks, they had somewhere a fishbowl um, example that they did. There's there's better illustrations I've seen of this kind of stuff, but basically, um, if you want bubbles inside of a water, you can just put spheres inside of it and flip them around. And then the renderer will know because it hits like the back face or that's why I said to reverse them um, to treat it like it's going from water to air. So you have inside and outside IORs and it will know like to transition between the two of them basically. You were joking. You were capping when you said <laughs> go to the bully in them. So I'll stop the play blast for now or the flip book. Um, and then one thing I can do again is like just to have some artistic control over some of this stuff. Uh, if I don't want these particles to be to ever get too big, um, you might want to use the min uh, function. You can clamp as well. I don't know, I'm a bit more. I don't like to type as many things. So use minimum, we'll say use the smaller of these two values. So we'll say never let these bubbles get bigger than 0 0.01 units. But it will still shrink them when they get close to the surface. So we can get rid of, of the penetration and stuff like that. Um, maybe based, based off of our new size, we want some more of them. Uh, so we could change it depending on our desire with what type of, of fluid we want to uh, to represent. Um, so I think, I don't know. I think I remember seeing some, maybe I got myself into the meditation zone. Somehow it's not doesn't like me searching for IOR. <laughs> so this is kind of what I'm saying. Like, I don't know if this is what they're, uh, I think this is, they have two different tints of glass and stuff like that. But basically, if you're imagining this red area as like a sphere that's been flipped around, the ray tracer fires the ray from the camera, it hits this, and looks at the surface attributes or the direction the normals are hitting. It says, I hit a front face, I'm going from air to water. And then it hits the back face of this and it's kind of like tricking the renderer or it thinks it's going outside of the fluid. So it says, I'm going back into air, Let's keep going. It's this surface. And then it says, oh, I'm going back into the fluid again. I'm exiting air and going back into fluid. And then it hits this again and then it, keeps going. You just have to make sure your refraction and reflection limits and stuff are set up properly. We could do a render right now and double check that. So this is what I'm saying with the reverse. Depends where you want to put it. Um, either way should be fine. So if I move, then you can see that these Something's happening. <laughs> Maybe with these being primitives, I need to switch them to polygons. So they need to actually be triangles or kind of, some kind of mesh, like I was saying earlier. Um, so this is what I'm saying if like I'm moving. Oh, thank you for the sub, Cyber. I appreciate it. So I'm doing like a first person shooter POV with the ray right now that this is what the renderer does. It's going from the camera, boom, it hits the surface. It says, all right, what's going on? I've gone inside of the, <laughs> you guys are enjoying this one, the Kim K 
Tim fans. Um, I traced, I hit the start of the surface, the ray keeps going, then it says, oh, I hit a, a backwards facing uh, polygon. I'm going back into air. Oh, I hit another forward facing polygon. I'm going back into water. All right, another backward facing one, I'm going back into air. So th that's basically what the renderer is thinking about or doing when I try it. Let's see if I'm, if I'm right. I might have <laughs> been lying that whole time. I'll be proven wrong, but I think I'm correct. So get rid of the box. Don't display the fluid. We don't need the fluid interior. Um, the, this is a different kind of thing. Like just, I usually just delete it or get rid of it. Mantra has it, I'll be doing, I'll be, I'm gonna render this with Redshift for right now, but most of these, uh, we could try it with both if you guys want to. Um, so I'll do a grid. Um, we could just go into this, do object merge. You wanna do mantra, Brando? We could do both. It's, it's, it's a pretty easy to, to inspect. Um, so I can go into ground plane and grab that. Then I just have to do into this object, I think. Something happened. <laughs> it doesn't like it. So I think maybe instead of a slash colon, um, I think I got myself into a mess doing it this way. Just gonna do dop import. <clears throat> so with this one, I'll just grab the ground plane. The DOP network, auto DOP, object mask, anything that starts with ground and fetch geometry. Um, so we'll make our camera. I usually set this. Alex, good to see you. So set this aperture usually to 36. Maybe this lens should be longer. Um, so we're, we're setting up a little fluid, kind of like a jam or something like that. Um, let's see if I can find uh, something. So you could have, you could use these points to do seeds. We're doing bubble right now. <laughs> it started out as a ball sack, now it's poop. So I'm thinking kind of something like this, jello, I don't know, jelly or something that has some, some air bubbles or something going on inside of it. Um, just save it. This will be maybe viscous bubbles and with it, for whatever reason like the when you save you're seeing the hip file changes and it needs to to re-simulate stuff sometimes um all right so i'll make a material network i'm going to start with redshift so we'll just do rs material builder um Switch the material to water. <laughs> you can, if you <laughs> if you do it right, if you <laughs> you try to do whatever you want, sometimes you end up not doing what you want. Then under out, uh, redshift render. Uh, the last thing we need is a light. It depends what you're trying to do, but sometimes. Uh, you're just getting started setting up glass or fluids, like doing a dome light or HDR is a good uh, starting point. Just so you have somewhat realistic reflections and stuff. Um, I have a folder here that I've prepared, different HDRs and stuff. And we'll just do this outdoor one.
It didn't work. Looks like a tongue. <laughs> so the main thing was I forgot to change my material over. Um, the shelf tool sets it up with that one. I'd, what I want to do is use my Redshift material. Redshift doesn't understand the mantra ones. Um, and then it looks a little bit hard to see what's going on. So let's play around with this stuff. Um, so I'm, go I'm gonna go in here and change my, okay. So the render flag is over here and I was just visualizing this. So if I hold down T, move the render flag over. Now we can see we have the, the air bubbles. So it looks correct. What do you guys think? Proper? <laughs> Properly done? Kind of like a seltzer, seltzer water dripping viscously or something. Um, if you go under the transmittance, um, I think you can change this into something that's more of like a, maybe like a sports drink. Now we're closer to maybe a jam or something like that. Hand sanitizer. <laughs> what would that be? That's like a little blue or, or light blue or something like that. Some nice soap or something. <laughs> yeah, so the, this is a super nice way to stick air or like, like I was saying, I could, could have copied seeds. Sometimes with the hand sanitizer, you have like the little sparkly balls or spheres inside of it as well. Um, you could copy like little chunks of metal or something reflective if you wanted like glitter inside. <laughs> Corona. I don't, uh, a, oh, the hand sanitizer. <laughs> so, um, thank you, Fibla. I appreciate it. Yeah, so this this way is a really good way to trap things in inside of fluids. Um, maybe depending on the, the, this is hand sanitizer, we want like some roughness or something. Just so it's, I don't know, maybe a little bit more gelatinous and less uh, glassy. You go super high, kind of get an idea what I mean. Like this is more of a, uh, I don't know. It's like more of a silicone gel or something like that and less of a uh, smooth like surface. I don't really know what it is about the the material or the fluid that makes it uh, like, but basically they're, you're saying that there's more particles or stuff inside of it that's like looking through a swamp or like some, some depth or something. Um, we could go back into the particle fluid and change. So I was clamping the size limit. Like if I want some of these to be bigger, you you might run into, like you might want to do that viscous sparkling water. It's like a popsicle st stick or something like that. Some gooey candy that's like uh, got a lot of bubbles in it. Um, where you might want to do the Boolean is maybe with these bubbles to like union or join them together or to do something so that they aren't intersecting. That would be a good use for the Boolean, but for the main setup, like it's, you're basically recreating what this is doing if you were to Boolean the, the shell with the bubbles inside of it. Just doing the reverse, flip the normals around, will do it properly. You'd see if I don't do the reverse, this looks wrong because the, the renderer is getting tricked when it hits the faces that are flipped, the directions aren't proper. So you just need to make sure your, your spheres are reversed. You can either do it there or you could do it after the fact, but basically anything that's you're putting or sitting inside of the fluid, um, you just want those faces to be reversed and you're good to go. Um, so this is what I'm saying is like, once you know these building blocks of of uh, surfacing fluids and flipping the spheres around and stuff, then you can 
uh, start to break things and do like a pyro simulation and just add particles to it, you do the procedural noises and, and things like that. Like you, that's when you start to have a lot of fun. Um, maybe we'll go a little bit smaller. Maybe we'll do a big higher percent of them. Maybe we'll go even smaller. I might have gone too small. There's like little <laughs> microscopic details or something like that. Uh, you could do, try some multi-solver stuff. I don't know what the best effect is or what lends itself best to, to multi-solving. Um, you want like some build, build from scratch. So like the, um, the ball floating in water kind of result, that's kind of like multi-solver, like interaction between the, the flip and RBD solver. So multi-solver, like anytime you're, you're doing forces with, uh, particles, like those are all set up kind of through multi-solver, if that makes sense. If you have specific examples or effects or s scenarios or whatever, you could feel free to put them in the suggestions channel for the discord. That's, that's pretty much how we got into bubbles today was, uh, just through suggestions through the community. Um, so it looks pretty good and we've, we've verified the result. Um, what I'll do here is just save. We'll save this one. Just add redshift in all capitals after the version. Um, and then if we want to check, so it just has to update some things with the, after you change the file name. Um, turn, turn that off. We could go into the regular render view. Um, delete the redshift nodes, add a mantra node. Um, and then we just need to switch this light. We could use the same texture but Houdini uses a different HDRI or dome light. Um, and then I can make another material network, maybe this one for Houdini shaders or mantra shaders. Um, this one depends as well. So like, <clears throat> I usually prefer to start with this classical shader, the cherries. Um, there's also the princess castle. Where did it go? Uh, and you should be able to do water fluids with, with both of these. We could test them a little bit. So I did actually make one of the higher tier emojis for my channel. Um, it does happen to be the pr princess castle like that. <laughs> I, I think I made it the the highest tier because I didn't I don't I didn't want to see it too much. Have a good uh, sleep, Alex. Good to see you stopping in. Um, so maybe this classical shader could just drag and drop it. Um, just verify that it got assigned. If I want to switch this to a relative path, I could do that. Um, we should be ready to to do a test render. Just see if, see if we get similar reasonable results or see what happens. So this mantra is just a bit slower, especially for um, fluids and surf surfaces with reflections and refractions and stuff like that. And it also doesn't have the presets set up as easily. That's why I went into here, like if you want um, under materials, they have some presets here, but the redshift kind of drop down is nice to have. Then you don't have to keep reassigning. You could just change the settings. We're doing water. We just don't want diffuse. Um, this one already has a reflection. Maybe for crystal clear water, we want the sharpest reflection or no roughness. 
Uh, we need refractions for water. We'll just hold down shift, set a render region here. So we get this, <laughs> uh-oh, you don't think it's working or it's just terrifyingly slow? <laughs> No, I'm getting close to wrapping. <laughs> so we're going to start Mantra. This stream is now turning into a multi-day stream. This is going to be a week-long stream. Um, but it, it looks like it's working with with Mantra, the way that things are set up. Uh, we can do, probably do a similar thing with the transmittance. Get ourselves into a somewhat similar territory. Yeah, that to me is the biggest. <laughs> so with the mantra, usually I'll switch to um, the faux caustics or whatever with doing fluids. Like that will at least give you some color in your shadows where it should. Uh, but yeah, with caustics with mantra is pretty much impossible to <laughs> to do with water and glass and everything and get get that done in a reasonable amount of time. Um, so I was also doing some roughness with reflection with redshift. We can replicate the same thing here. Um, but yeah, just doing glass or water shaders with mantra, it's like even to see what the, the result looks like, it's a bit too slow. That's why I'm mainly using redshift. The only thing I would ever really think about doing is volumes with mantra. It's still pretty fast and, and good with, with that kind of result. Um, so we might want to change this a little bit. And I think roughness, I was at something a little bit higher. I might have to link these up. Like with Redshift, it will automatically get the roughness from the, uh, Reflection, but for with, with the classical shader, you have to set them yourself, it looks like. Like Redshift, it was always setting the roughness to be the same. Uh, I don't think it's faster. Like, most of the time, it's it seems like it's a little less faster, depending on like the CPU you have. If you have one of the AMD ones with the, the Threadripper, it might be faster. But um, it's just generally more controllable and like easier to get the results you're after. Lincoln Black, how's it going? So now with this roughness, we're getting closer to to where we were with Redshift. So yeah, generally, any any. Um, bubbles you're making underwater this this is the the best way to start at least as an approach to making them um, if you're doing whitewater based effects you might want to add more roughness just to the bubbles so that like they become more specular or more blurry um, so I could assign two different shaders to the outside and inside and get like color changes or just different material responses um, you can also just copy like bits of volume to them. You won't get reflections or refractions, but you'll get like kind of murkiness or something like that. Jeffrey, thank you for the tier three. <laughs> Absolute madman. You want the, uh, you really want the princess castle emoji to, to torment me with? Um, so this, <laughs> it's learning too much. So, um, <laughs> so um, if we want to, we can also try this principled, the Princess Castle shader. Um, so with Mantra, you can drag and drop directly onto the render view. I don't think you can do that with Redshift materials. With Redshift, it will, or Mantra, it will know what pixel you're dropping like shaders onto. Um, so this principal shader works a little bit differently. Um, I think basically we need to, um, maybe just set the albedo to zero. So ba basically that's saying don't do any diffuse. Um, 
and then the transparency is basically ref refractions like they're linked in a similar manner um i think the so, somehow side effects actually made a shader slower than the classic shader with the principal shader so that's another reason i don't like it is i just think it's generally slower um <laughs> They outdid themselves this time, made something even slower than before. So again, just set this tra transmittance, trans transmission, transmission color. Um, and you should be getting something similar to, to what you had, uh, what we had before. So this is how you do the same type of thing. And again, this time they are linked up like the roughness Joao, good to see you. Bomdia, you a, are you a Brazilian Joao or a Portuguese Joao? Um, so that's this roughness is linked up in a way that it it affects specular and transparency or refraction at the same time. Um, yeah, I think that's one of the reasons it's slower. Um, I also think the way that they treat Fresnel, like IOR and all of that type of stuff is a little bit different such that you always get very hot or like bright edge reflections, which causes the ray tracer to take a lot of time to, uh, to resolve. Like basically I think the principled shader gives you a lot of noises like render noise or it takes a lot, lot longer for it to resolve the edges of specular surfaces. Hello from Portugal. What is it? You're, uh, it's like seven hours ahead. It's like 10, 11 PM there right now. Um, but yeah, you could still get, I mean, it's meant to be more user friendly, I think in terms of parameters where this is, this is more similar to games, like PBR games workflow, texture authoring and all that stuff. Um, that's the main reason why they did it is so you could take textures from like Substance or Marmoset and they would have albedo and they would all line up or whatever. But this is more similar to Arnold or V-Ray style shading or cycles or that kind of stuff. Um, the, the maths is generally the same. But like I was saying, this one might just treat edges and stuff like that a little bit differently. But both of them are generally about as slow, I would say, like generally any time of fluid, I would know, I would always try to use Redshift with it. You could like those frames were pretty instantaneous, essentially. Um, so yeah, I'll just save this one. Switch it up for Mantra. Um, yeah, so this, there's, this is some basics with bubbles, probably getting close to ending it here. Um, but yeah, this, the, I would say this is like the fundamental concepts. We might do another stream with bubbles, getting closer to that, like underwater, um, look, maybe try and flip or pyro and everything with them. Yeah, of course. It's glad to hear you guys are, are learning things and I'm not just rambling too long about stuff thanks everyone for the subs uh if you have amazon prime and you're not using it with twitch you can link it and like you that will give you a free sub you can give to me or <laughs> anyone you want to give it to um if you already subbed or anything like that just feel free to share my channel around and that uh yeah it's giving bezos's money to me essentially because it's not taking, it doesn't cost you anything to, to, to uh, subscribe with Prime, but it gives me money from, from Bezos's revenue stream. Stonks, the, the money goes up. Um, but yeah, if you, if you don't have a Prime or you don't have subscriptions or whatever, just feel free to share my channel with other people. That, that's a, another good way to support me, help the community grow. For Hardias, thank you for the Twitch Prime. Yeah, Fibula. So I'm hoping um, just eventually we'll build this out, grow the community. Um, I'm planning to try to do maybe just some more 
general redshift rendering <laughs> Bezos stocks. His uh, yeah, his personal wealth is just growing exponentially. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, that's a, one of the nice things about Twitch is they have uh, the Amazon subsidiary or whatever. Um, and sorry to anyone that gets ads. I try not to really run ads or anything like that. Um, but yeah, I'm planning to do like some redshift, um, general shading, just materials and stuff like that kind of offline tutorial. So I'm hoping to put that up on YouTube or maybe I'll try to put it up here if I can. Um, hopefully that will get some new, new people introduced to everything that way as well. So save the, the hip files. Yeah, AWS uh, is controls like every, it's like the entire internet in terms of storage and servers and even in terms of like electricity consumption, I think it's, they, they use more electricity than like the entire city of Chicago, Washington DC, and like other city, a lot of cities, they use more electricity than them. Um, yeah, so with Redshift on sale, I think doing this tutorial might get me some better exposure and stuff like that as as well. Um, but yeah, hope, hope you guys enjoy the rest of your Wednesday. Good evening to the EU, uh, everyone else on that side of the, the world. Enjoy the rest of your Wednesday to everyone in the Americas. Um, doing the cool zone on Friday. So it's just the daily, um, art, draft, sketch, whatever you want to call it. Uh, so hopefully you guys come back, see people on Friday. The cheat zone, into the cool zone. All right, later.